you know, we are walking through really kind of the entirety of this year through the Gospel of Mark. And this morning, we find ourselves in chapter 10. So I'd like to ask you to grab a Bible or a device by which you can get to the Bible and open up to Mark chapter 10. Uh, The verses won't be up on the screen, so you'll need a Bible in church this morning, either through your mobile device or an analog version, whichever you brought with you. But I'm going to be reading and teaching from the New King James Version this morning. But our hope, our heart, our intent is to cover the first 12 verses of that chapter. But I'd like to say something about that before we jump into the text, before we learn so that we can live. And it's simply this. I really do believe that one of the most challenged things in life, listen, not one of the most challenging, yes, it it is this, but I believe that one of the most challenged things in life, something that there's opposition to, one of the most challenged things in life is to believe the right things about God. That's why you have a book in black and white. So here here it is. This is what I I want you to know. I think our culture, our world, our own flesh, the fact that we have an enemy who doesn't play pickup basketball but of NBA quality has a strategy, are constantly vying to diminish, distort, discredit, destroy a right perspective of who God is, who he is, how he operates, and ultimately what he wants. If I can draw your attention to this thought, this concept, this reality, before we step into Mark chapter 10 this morning, I want to submit to you that one of the most challenged things in life is to believe the right things about God. You know, I just returned last evening, to last night, from spending about 28 hours or so in the Tampa area of our great state of Florida with, with some men at a men's retreat at a, at a local Calvary there in Tampa. The theme of our time together was taken from the 13th verse of the 16th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And it reads like this. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave. Or as the old King Jimmy, the old King James puts it, quit you like men, which means act like men. Be strong. And one of the truths that we kind of gleaned together in our time together this weekend was this reality, that ultimately what we're designed for and ultimately what we desire, even though we may not be able to articulate this or even recognize this, that our ultimate design and ultimate desire, I really believe, is to have a life that is strong in him. A life that would be described as a sense of firmness and fruitfulness. Let me share with you maybe the words of the psalmist and the the words of Jesus to describe what I mean by that. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3, describing a life that I believe that is rooted and grounded appropriately. The psalmist would say, it's like a tree, that life planted beside rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose, whose leaf also doesn't wither, and whatever he does prospers. It's a life like Jesus described to his disciples. And i got to be honest with you. I'll never forget the moment that this verse was shared with me in this kind of context. I was living in southern Oregon at the time at a pastoral discipleship school. And the pastor, the gentleman who was leading that discipleship program, had been associated and connected with our association of churches, Calvary Chapel, for years, nearly since its beginning. And he said, men, what's the bullseye? What's the secret to the Christian life? I mean, we all went to Sunday school. Rhymes with Jesus, right? Jesus, right? That's what we all said. He goes, no. I said, what? Oh, no. I've already failed. I'm in the school. What? We didn't get the first lesson right. He said, what's the the secret? What's the purpose? What's the bullseye? What's God looking for? And he quoted this, John 15, 8. Jesus said, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. I'm so thankful for that song we just sang because without that perspective that we're just a branch 
It's the vine that produces the fruit. You could take that in a very different way. But the reality is God wants us connected to him, not just as an end to itself, but so that fruit would be produced in our lives for the enjoyment and the benefit of others. That's the bullseye. One of the most challenged things in life, I really believe there's opposition to this in our culture, our world, our own flesh, our enemy, is to believe the right things about God. And, and I really, I'm just convinced that a life that's firm and fruitful is ultimately what you're designed for and it's ultimately what you desire. And that God... The things that he desires for us, they're not just good. They're for our good. That God is actually for us. He doesn't intend evil for us. But his purposes, his ways, the things that come out of left field, they go beyond us. Would anyone maybe agree with that? Like, I didn't anticipate that. But they're good. Why do I share that this morning? I think it's a little bit foundational to the text that we're about to step into. See, we're in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and we're considering the teachings of Jesus. Nothing new for us. For those of us that have been walking through this Gospel week in, week out this year, we've considered a number of different teachings from Jesus. He's, he's taught us on the Sabbath what that looks like, parables on the realities and the dynamics of the kingdom of God, inner purity, even just last week, what it looks like for true greatness in the kingdom. Today, he's teaching once again. But it's kind of interesting. He's teaching, as we'll read in just a few moments, and, and his critics, can you believe that even Jesus had critics? His enemies, they kind of seek to back him into a corner to give a teaching, to give a perspective, to give his mindset on divorce. And you'll see how Jesus spends that to actually teach on what's central in that is a right understanding of what marriage actually is. And I think, maybe, I hope we could all agree that our culture, our world, our flesh, the devil definitely, are seeking to mold, shape, and redefine what marriage is. Uh, the world, I think, sometimes offers a perspective that has a tone to it. They go, man, there's, that sounds right. right? Like, it seems like there's truth in that perspective. Sounds good. But ultimately goes against the design of God. And if it goes against the design of God, it's intended for destruction in our own lives. Let me give you an example. Can I read a book from a time gone past, the 1980s? Anyone remember the 80s? 1980s, 40 years ago. Can you believe that when you say that? I think 40, oh man, what's happening? <laughs> Here's an example. Your marriage can wear out. People change. Their values and lifestyles. People want to experience new things. Change is a part of life. Change and personal growth are traits for you to be proud of and indicative of a vital, searching, growing mind. Well, who doesn't want that? You must accept the reality that in today's multifaceted world that it is especially easy for two persons to grow apart. Letting go of your marriage, if it is no longer fulfilling, can be one of the most successful things you've ever done. <coughs> Getting a divorce can be a positive problem-solving, growth-oriented step, it can and should be seen as a personal triumph. Nearly 40 years ago, a book by the name of Divorce, How and When to Let It Go. I'd say that perspective's predominant. Hey, if it's unfulfilling... If you need a change, which change, that's a good thing, right? But listen, change isn't always a good thing. And nothing could be more off from the design and definition of what marriage is and intended to be than that perspective. But listen to me. Man, the enemy of your soul, he's the candy maker. 
the candy maker of sugar-coated poison apples. Man, and it looks and sounds and smells. Ah, he's like the Pied Piper. He's the guy that invented Pleasureland for Pinocchio. It looks and sounds, and for a season. This makes sense. This feels good. There's an element of truth to this. But it's designed to destroy you. It's designed to murder that which God wants to intend for good in your life. I need to share this with you because you are engaged in a culture with more preachers than any other generation. It's called TikTok. It's called YouTube. It's called Facebook. It's, there are so many new platforms that are sharing messages and content. And what you consistently and constantly view does become you. You can't help it but absorb your atmosphere. Part of human nature to a certain degree. And one of the most challenged things of a 21st century breathing human, I really believe, is to believe the right things about God. It's constantly coming under challenge. But here's the thing. The designer gets to be the definer. You know, like recently, I don't know, maybe last couple weeks, three weeks maybe, my older girls, my daughters, have been watching this series. We've been watching it with them. Kind of on the life, the life of Walt Disney. No, no matter what your convictions and opinions are on the state of that current company, the man, 100 years ago or so, especially in this era of time as we're watching, especially when he was kind of creating the first Disneyland experience, I mean, that guy was a designer, an architect. They called him an imagineer, so to speak, of the future. And it's very clear through these documentaries that we're watching. That Imagineer, that designer, he had a right. He had the right to define the culture and the standards and all that Disneyland was going to be. He was the guy. He's the designer, so he is de facto the definer. Well, as we get into Mark 10 this morning... This is something that we'll be reminded of. Jesus is going to quote from this passage in Genesis chapter 2 where we see very clearly that God is the author, the designer of life and of marriage. Let me read this to you out of Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And the Lord God said, It's not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. Verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and as he slept, the word says he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, the word is rabona. This is, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And therefore, the word says, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As the designer, God is the definer of what marriage is, what it isn't. He sets the boundaries. And here's what we're going to see this morning. This morning... The words of Jesus, especially in a first century context, but also a 21st century context, his words, they're revolutionary and they're rigid. Amen. Rigid and revolutionary. The, the, the things that Jesus will share this morning. You see, we're going to step into a scene where a trap is being baited and set for Jesus to step into by his critics and by his enemies. But I believe through this text, here's my hope when we leave this room in 30 minutes or so. My hope is that we'll see the heart of God and the awesomely powerful priority, importance, and sanctity of the marriage relationship between a husband and wife. I think that's what this text draws us to. And I want to share with you that God's design and our ultimate desire, like I shared earlier, is for a life that's firm and fruitful. It's the same for marriage, to be strong in him. And what Jesus will share today, especially at the end of our time, it's revolutionary, it's rigid. 
but it's ultimately for our good. And I hope that this morning, well, it's a bit of a challenge for us. In this arena of marriage, in this arena of divorce, as he'll be asked about, but in any arena of our life, to simply trust God that his ways are not just truly best, not just good, but for our good. And to awaken to this reality that one of the most challenged things in life is to believe the right things about God. And it's my hope and prayer as we spend time in this text that by his spirit, through his word, he would make firm in your heart his truth. And that we would learn that so that we could, do you remember what it is? It rhymes with sieve but starts with an L so that we could live it. There's three more people that got it than at the end of the announcement. So that we're making progress this morning already into the introduction. Mark chapter 10. Father, I just ask and pray in as much sincerity and humility as I possibly can that you would give me the ability just to serve you and serve your people well as we study this text together. Lord, we need your grace. We need your mercy. And I just ask, Lord, that we would be able to lean into your grace and mercy and truth and love as we study your word. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 and 2. If you're there with me, let me know by saying, Jesus loves me. Jesus. That's good. That's true. Verse 1. Then he arose from there, came into the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came. And they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife, testing him? The scene here in Mark 10, it changes. Mark tells us that the geography changes. Jesus leaves an area that's kind of well-worn, very familiar for he and his disciples. Capernaum, Galilee, where he spent a tremendous amount of his time on earth comes to the area of Judea. Ultimately, he's headed to Jerusalem. I mean, next chapter, chapter 11, we'll read about Jesus riding into Jerusalem, headed towards the cross. Mark makes this mention that he's in this new region of Judea. But here's what's even more interesting about this contextually. What we even have read about this in the Gospel of Mark, it it's, has to do with his cousin, John the Baptist, or others would call him J the B. This area was ruled at the time by Herod Antipas. And Herod, he had this kind of immoral, unlawful, incestuous marriage to Herodias. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, there in that area of Judea, was arrested and ultimately lost his life, lost his head, because he spoke on this topic that these critics are asking Jesus about. Do you get the context? Jesus leaves an area where everybody loves him, right? Capernaum, doing lots of amazing things, amazing teachings. He steps into Judea, same kind of dynamic, right? We see the crowds coming to Jesus. He's starting to teach, and this isn't anything new. These critics show up, the Pharisees, in a region where one of Jesus' family members lost his life for speaking publicly about divorce, about a remarriage that was unlawful. And Jesus' cousin died. Well, the antagonist of Jesus' ministry here, just another layer of context, they had this kind of interesting alliance with these people known as the Herodians. You may not know who they are and may ask, why does this matter? Well, the Pharisees, you may know this, were staunchly religious and almost like in our language today, we'd call them Zionists, like Israel first. We want no form of oppression that is foreign to be over us. They wanted Rome to be subdued, subdued and they were looking for their Messiah to accomplish that. Not the Herodians. You know who they were? They were those that thought, you know, we're favorable to having Roman rule. Let's see if we can align our agenda with the political agenda and kind of marry them together. The point is these two groups never got along, united, or agreed upon anything except for one thing. We want Jesus to go down. So the Pharisees here in Mark 10, from kind of a casual, if you're just reading verses 1 and 2 of Mark 10, 
I don't know, does it strike you as kind of an off-the-wall question? Like, hey, uh, Jesus, what about divorce, huh? Well, that's not kind of the language. The language here is that they were four-year-olds. Anyone ever met a four-year-old? This is what it was like. Hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus, hey, Jesus. They were in, like, intentional about seeking to back Jesus, bait Jesus into a trap to give an answer. They're provoking, not genuinely asking, but they have an agenda. Have you ever had a question like that? Maybe you don't have a four-year-old. I have one. I love my four-year-old. He just turned five yesterday, but sometimes there's an agenda to the question. Not always a bad one, but there's an agenda. Hey, hey, hey. That's what's happening here. Why are they asking this? Well, they're testing him. They're trying to trap him. With their connection to the Herodians, I think they're hoping, hey, as soon as he says something, go tell Herod. Hey, remember John the Baptist? His cousin's here. He's doing the same thing he did. But also there's this second layer to the dynamic that's happening with these antagonists of Jesus. Within Judaism, there were conflicting opinions of what merited divorce. Two primary camps, kind of a conservative view and a liberal view. The conservative perspective said that only some form of premarital sin would make an allowance for a divorce. Liberal perspective, and they were led by different rabbis who kind of purported these two different perspectives. They said, you know what? The husband and the husband alone, he has the right to divorce. And you know, if he wakes up one morning and the breakfast is just a little too salty, enough said, she's gone. <laughs> if the dinner's cold when he gets home, there it is. You know, it got even so bad and so liberal that the religious leaders would say, Guys, if you meet another woman, and in your eyes, her beauty surpasses your wife's, you're free from the marriage. The sanctity, the importance, the high priority of marriage was lost in that culture. So what does Jesus do? Does he stumble into the trap? Does he take the bait? Now look at verse 3. Jesus is amazing. Look at what he does. He answers and says to them, hey, what did Moses command you? Man, this is brilliant. He takes them to like their king of the hill leader, Moses. Not going to go against old Mo. Their response, look at verse 4. Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and dismiss her. Did you catch that? They didn't answer Jesus' question. He said, what did they command? And they said, well, this is what Moses said we could get away with. And that's why Jesus says in verse 5, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this precept. You can read about this precept in Deuteronomy 24. One of the resources we make available to our small groups, connect groups that are going through kind of a study and the same study that we're doing on Sunday morning in their groups is a little, little commentary by Warren Wearsby. And for those of you that will be in those kind of settings, I wanted to read something he shares that kind of summarizes the intent of Deuteronomy 24. It says it better than I ever will, so here's what he says. By giving this commandment to Israel, God was not putting his approval on divorce or even encouraging it. Rather, he was seeking to restrain it and make it more difficult for men to dismiss their wives. He put sufficient regulations around divorce so that the wives would not become victims of their husband's whims. Without a bill of divorcement, a woman could easily become a social outcast. No man would want to marry her. She'd be left defenseless and destitute. And I want you to remember this next thing he says, especially for the end of our time together this morning. Among the Jews, the question was not, may a divorced woman marry again because remarriage was permitted and even expected. The big question was, what are the legal grounds for a man to divorce his wife? Set yourself in the setting of Deuteronomy, a nomadic group of people moving around Divorce had become rampant and very confusing. So Moses says, at least let there be a bill of divorce for the woman. That's the intent of this. And what Jesus has to say goes very much against the liberal view of the day. I mean, some of the rabbis were saying, if a man has a bad wife, it's his religious duty to divorce her. That sounds a little bit like the 1980s of what we read earlier. Jesus goes against this way of thinking, and he says, 
I'm not going to talk about the grounds. I want to take you back to what God intends. As the designer, he's the definer. And here's how he defines marriage. Verse 6. From the beginning, please pay attention to this. Don't tune out just yet. From the beginning, please lean into this. It's Genesis. You know this from Sunday school. But for some reason, it's easy to forget. From the beginning of creation, God made them. What does it say there, church? Okay. That is not the NUT version, Neil's uninspired translation, the nutty version of Christianity. No, that's, that's what it says. And did you catch the magnanimous importance of what Jesus just said? That God made them. Who, who's the subject here? Who made them? God. You got that? What did he make them? God made them male and female. As the designer, he is the definer, not for just identity, but for marriage. I was asked this question by my kids. Dad, why does that matter? One man, one woman, one lifetime. Like, that's not how marriage is seen anymore. Here's why that matters. Because one of the most challenged things you're going to experience in life is to believe the right things about God. And if you allow that which God defines to be redefined, then you are the definer. You've changed roles from the created to the creator. You've bought into that slippery lie of the enemy. Has God really said he's keeping something from you, Genesis chapter 3? Allow God to be who he is. He's the creator. He's the designer. He's the definer. And you need to believe this. You need to know this. That what he says and what he does is not just good. Yeah, that's what God... It's for your good. One of the things that the enemy would love for you to believe is that, oh, no, God's holding back from you. He's trying to keep you. Do you remember who the enemy is? He's the candy maker. And his best-selling product is the sugar-coated poison apple that everyone just keeps biting until they get to the core and it kills. The enemy has a plan for your life. And it is to murder that which God wants to do in your life. I believe what God wants for your life is a life that's firm and fruitful. Now, I believe it's what you're ultimately designed for and what you ultimately desire. But the world, the culture, the flesh, the enemy is vying, seething to distort, to diffuse, to deter, to distract, to destroy Your knowledge of who God is and what he says. Jesus doesn't fall into the trap. He says, I want, you're, you're, not getting, you're not mixed up on what Moses is saying about divorce. You're mixed up on the meaning of marriage. That's the core issue here. So he says in verse 7, look, he starts to unpack it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one. You know, I need things to be somewhat helpful to remember. With six kids, at least they all start with the letter L, right? Okay, I know who. In marriage, can I share this? this is maybe, hopefully this will help you remember. There's a leaving, there's a cleaving, there's a weaving. A leaving, a cleaving, and a weaving. You say, what do you mean? Jesus says, here's marriage. There's a leaving. A whole new family is being started. The, the biblical mindset is not that the in-laws are gaining a son or gaining a daughter, but that a new family identity is being created. That's the biblical perspective on marriage, that there's a leaving. Oh, it doesn't mean absolutely you don't benefit from the fruit of your son or daughter having a, new, having a partner. But, but the perspective is they're developing their own. There's a leaving. And then there's a cleaving. They're joined together. And then they begin to weave together a new life together. It's amazing how quickly Jesus changes the focus of the question from divorce to marriage. There was confusion about divorce. 
But ultimately what there was was confusion about the powerful priority, the importance, and the sanctity of the marriage relationship between a husband and wife. I really respect and appreciate Pastor David Guzik. Not a perfect guy, but he is called the, uh, the sermonator for a reason, right? Just as a point of application, for like a 21st century couple, let me just share this with you. I think it's helpful. He says, the emphasis on marriage rather than divorce is a wise approach for anyone interested in keeping a marriage together. Divorce can't be seen as an option when things are hard because marriage, marriage is like a mirror. It reflects what we put into it. If someone has divorce readily in his or her mind as a convenient option, divorce will be more likely. See, the goal of marriage is both fact and focus. The fact is, is that they're building a life together. They're becoming one. And then that is also the focus of marriage, becoming one. That's the design from the one who defines it. And there's this idea and the language here of, of gluing together. But honestly, the language here of, of becoming one it's like the, the same kind of wording using to describe how muscle is attached to the bone. And the pain of like living tissue being torn from the bone. Anyone ever had the muscle detached from the bone? Isn't that fun? Isn't that awesome? Can't you? It's just, oh, look what happened on Monday. That's great. No. Nobody like, no. To, to describe this to your kids, this, to, this afternoon, go home and take two construction sheets of paper and use super glue. Slap them together, leave them overnight, say, okay, kids, we're going to separate them now. It doesn't work. That's why Jesus says in verse 9 that, that it's not just a physical thing, but it's a spiritual thing. He says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. It's not just a social contract that if man, well, I guess in that culture, the bacon wouldn't be salty, but the eggs might be, right? She's got, no, it's not a social contract. It's spiritually binding, spiritually binding. Again, just to quote Guzik, I, I, I think this is helpful. He says, Jesus reminds us that divorce is really like amputation. Sometimes in the most extreme circumstances, amputation may be the right thing to do. But the patient must first have a diagnosis worthy of such an extreme solution. I mean, that's not something you do on a Thursday, right? Like, we're going to go get breakfast at first watch, might get something amputated, and then we're going to go to the beach, right? Like, no. Like, this is intense. Like, the point, guys, please get this, because we're about to get into a section with Jesus that is the most revolutionary, the most rigid, and that may warrant a response from some of us that go, hmm, The purpose of this text, the purpose of what Jesus is doing is to draw the attention back to the beauty, to the sanctity, to the importance, to the priority of the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. That's what this text, I hope it's what you leave this morning with is, wow, what God does in marriage is awesome. It should be protected. It should be celebrated. It should be taken seriously. It should be seen as a beautiful thing. Christians, you know that it's like the tangible expression of what Christ and the church's relationship looks like. It's an awesome thing. But we're about to leave this public scene and get, kind of go behind closed doors. We're about to step into a scenario where his disciples go, hey, Jesus, tell us a little bit more about that. The, the trap that the Pharisees set failed completely. Jesus didn't lose his head like his cousin. He quotes God's heart and intent for marriage. But now his disciples have questions. Look at verse 10. We're almost done. In the house, his disciples also asked him about the same manner. So Jesus said to them, let the weight of these words hang there for what they are. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. First century hearer of this blows their minds. See, what do you mean? 
Um, women don't have any rights in this culture. No one, let me say this again, no one would have had this perspective that adultery was against a woman. No. Adultery was a thing that happened against a man. You say, what do you mean? Either the man of the woman that the adulterous relationship was with or against her father. Nothing to do with the woman. But see, you live in a world that would love to purport this perspective that Christianity is full of toxic masculinity. Couldn't be further from the truth. What Jesus does here is revolutionary. He says, male and female are created in the image of God. Infinite value, dignity, and worth in both genders. Different roles, different functions. But they complement one another. They're not meant to compete or be combative. They're meant to complement. See, when you walk in the design of the definer, things work. When you don't, you're seeking to exchange roles from created becoming the creator. From being the one who was designed to you being the definer. And I'm telling you, there's a hollowness of soul there. There's emptiness there. Because it's not how it's designed to work. You're designed to be the created. You're designed to be the, the, the branch. He's the vine. What Jesus says here is revolutionary. He puts men and women on an equal playing field. Revolutionary. But I think for 21st century hearers, for sure, this is rigid. This is rigid. What's the point? You've heard the point. It's to to share the awesomely powerful and priority and importance and sanctity of marriage. But this statement is overwhelming. It's overwhelming to the disciples. In Matthew chapter 19, there's a parallel account of what's happening here in Mark 10. And if you read Matthew 19, 10, the disciples said to him, if this is the case, if this is what marriage is, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Now, let me say this about the words of Jesus here. These are the words of Jesus. I know many of us want to know, but, but are there any exceptions to what Jesus says here? I, I find it very interesting that Mark doesn't include any in the text. Why? I think it's kind of his way of pointing towards the sobriety we should have concerning marriage vows. To highlight the priority and importance and sanctity of marriage. But also we recognize that this isn't the only verse in all of Scripture that teaches on marriage and divorce. In Matthew's gospel, twice Jesus points to sexual sin as a reason of permission for divorce. He didn't demand it. He allows for forgiveness to occur. But there is that exception there. The apostle Paul he, he gives his own provision in 1 Corinthians 7, 15. These are his words. If a non-believing spouse departs, the believing spouse is free. So, immorality, abandonment, these are the two exceptions we see in Scripture. Now, let me share a few words on this. We live in a world that celebrates and prioritizes personal fulfillment happiness, actualizing your potential, seemingly over anything, everything, and anyone and everyone else. It's seen as one of the highest of virtues. You've got to be all that you can be, to borrow an old phrase. I mean, that kind of mindset pairs well with that quote I read earlier, right? That letting go of your marriage, if it's no longer fulfilling, can be one of the most successful things you've ever done. Getting a divorce can be a positive, problem-solving, growth-oriented step. It should be and can be a personal triumph. But here's the thing. You won't find that in the Bible. Nothing wrong with being happy. No. Nothing wrong with reaching your potential. Absolutely not. But one of the most challenged things in life is to believe the right things about God. And one of the slippery slopes that we can constantly find ourselves in is exchanging good things for God. 
What do you mean by that? Um, does anyone want to make a salary? Like have money that comes in so you can buy things? Anyone want to do that? Okay, a couple of us, rest of you guys, you really have so much faith. Like, I, I need to make a salary. I got, I got six kids. I got to do, somehow that food's got to get on the table. Salary's not a bad thing. This may be seen as a bad thing at first mention, but status. It's not wrong to desire a good reputation. In fact, I think you should live for a good reputation. You should allow your character to be that which defines your reputation over time. You have no control over your reputation ultimately. Ultimately, people will say what they want about you, but you do have control over your character. And if you allow that to play out over time, eventually your character will, re will define your reputation if it's given the opportunity. You do have control over your character. Salary, status, good things. Nothing wrong. Live for, those are great things. Situations. Man, if we could get in this house, if we could maybe move to this community, if I could get in this job, new, new employer, nothing wrong with that. Get into that good situation. Salary, status, situation, stuff. There's certain things in life that are require stuff. I mean, we don't live in an area where there's a lot of public transportation. And unless you've got some amazing calves and you're all about walking, we need cars, right? We gotta get around. Nothing wrong with looking for an adequate, good vehicle. Stuff, salary, status. I'm not gonna go into the other four. My point is this. You've heard me say this a bazillion times. The challenge is when you exchange a good thing for a God thing, and what you ultimately do is you rob the good thing of the thing that God intended it for, and that good things are designed to bring an element of gratification. Nothing wrong with that. But you're not made for gratification. You're ultimately made for satisfaction of soul, which comes in a relationship with a Savior. That, that's the bullseye. And I just got to share something with you that it is so easy for me to lose focus of as a, dad, as a dad that cares for his six kids, as a husband that cares for his wife, as a pastor who cares for you. Sometimes I can have a perspective that can be a little bit off of what the bullseye of sanctification actually is. What, what's the bullseye of my life in following Jesus? It's not necessarily... A good thing. What do you mean? Well, that my kids get in the right schools and the right situation. That's a good, yes, that's a, that's a goal. But is it the, is it the bullseye? Is it exactly, is is if, I, if I only get this one shot, and, and this is where I need to win in this situation. Do you know what the Bible would say is the point of your sanctification? That you would become like Jesus. That's the bullseye. And you know what helps us grow? And become like Jesus more than anything else? Challenge. Difficulty. Sorrow. Martin Luther once said, the best book in my library is affliction. That's the one that helps me the most. Why do I share that? We live in a divorce culture. I, I mean, I don't even think I have to wager this. 100% of the people in the room are impacted at one, at one level or another by divorce. Personally, it's your, part of your story. Friends, family, most definitely entertainment. It's the culture we live in. And there are very real challenges in the world that we live in. Multiple reasons on a scale of reasons of why divorce happens in our culture. Incompatibility, not being or feeling in love, misery, financial mismanagement, abuse, addiction, conflict. These are no small things. These are weighty, difficult, challenging things. And in some instances, necessary steps need to be taken for separation. Or what the Bible would call celibacy within marriage, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 7. Yet although these challenges are serious and weighty, they fall short of the biblical permission for divorce. There very well may need to be, and justifiably so, separation, but there's still meant to be this sense of honor to the sanctity of the marriage vows between a husband and a wife. It, let me put it this way if I can. Let me put it more simply. It's as though the Bible doesn't have three different categories to describe people. It has two. 
It's not single, married, or divorced, but it's married, maybe separation there, or it's single. You've never been married, or there was that immorality or abandonment. I understand this is rigid. I can sense it in the room. There's an awesomely powerful priority and importance and sanctity to marriage between husband and wife. And that's the point of what Jesus is drawing the attention to. He's, not talking, he's talking about marriage. Don't you see how important this is? But let me, let me share this with you. Like, Where do we go from here? Right? How do we leave this room? I have a friend who lives in Monterey, California named Nate Holdridge. And he shared this, and I, I thought it was very helpful. And I want to share with you his words, not mine. So that way, if you don't like him, I can give you his number and you can call No, I'm just tease him. No, he, he shares this in a very, in a very well-spoken way. Let me share this with you. Speaking about this text, he says, we should respond by extending grace, by extending grace to our church community and beyond. These are admittedly hard words. Many of us here are divorced or remarried, and I'm sure many of those divorces and remarriages occurred outside the lordship of Christ. In other words, it's common for modern believers to ignore Jesus' teaching on these matters. And since we live in a divorce culture, it's, it's easy to quit. For this, we need grace. If you're in an unbiblical marriage, receive God's grace and move on. If it happened before Christ came into your life, know you're forgiven in his sight. If it happened while in Christ, humbly lament and accept his mercy. And if it happened because you didn't know the word, ask for his cleansing and move on. It's all we can do. And it is far better than a defiant attitude that disregards God's word. Instead, humbly move forward in his mercy and grace. Mercy and grace should be the tone of our lifestyles with one another. You know, there's, there's one sin that's going to keep you from heaven, not joining a connect group. You can't get in if you're not in a group. <laughs> right? It's the season. You didn't join. There's a white card in front of you. What's your problem? No. No, you know that sin, right? Coming under the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's the biggest barrier between you and God. Allowing him to forgive, allowing him to restore, allowing him to take which is ash and turn it into beauty. And I think we need to keep the, the big picture of Scripture in perspective as we talk about these things that Jesus shares that are revolutionary and rigid. And it should lead us to a second thing, to be biblically sensitive people. What do you mean by that? If you're considering marriage, I just want to encourage you to seek out good, solid, biblically competent pastoral input and support because they want the best for you. <laughs> That's all. If you're considering divorce, seek out good, solid, biblically competent pastoral input and support. Also church community. Also God's word. But like David Guzik had said, it's like amputation. It's not something you do without a really, really good diagnosis, both stepping into marriage and seeking, seeking to step out. And third thing, I think this should lead us to have a high respect and view of marriage, do everything we can to encourage it. Church, we live in a world where I think one of the most challenged things ever is to believe the right things about God, how he operates, what he wants. And we live in a world that has more preachers than any other culture I've ever seen. So don't get into the nutty versions of truth. The word of God is truth. Allow it to have its stay. And I think the way you do that, rhythmic living, it's my opinion, gathering together with the people of God to worship Jesus, make sure that the church service doesn't exist for the saved or the unsaved, but it exists for God, and everyone else benefits, those that don't yet know Jesus and those that do and are growing, but that a worship service is too for and about him, that when we sing and you didn't like the song, it's okay because it's not for you, like it's for him, like that kind of perspective of church, 
think you should gather with that kind of a church. That's my opinion. And I think you should be in groups and community because we need to lean into one another. By human definition, the 13 elements that are you and me are the same 13 that make up dirt. We need help. We, need pe- we have blind spots. We need community around us that can say, hey, I see this. You should be encouraged in this. And hey, I see this. Like You need to, you need to be exhorted about this. No one should be Han Solo seeking to do Christianity with some weird pet, and that's life. Like, I got Chewy with me, like, that's my Christian experience. No, you're in community. You're gathering with God's people. There's, there's an element of qualified leadership in that place. There, there's commitments to what Scripture says. Church is intended to be for you, not, not against you. And let me just close with this. It's how I began. I, I'm just convinced of it. That, that the life that God designed for you and that ultimately you desire, I think is a, a life that's firm in him. You're the branch. He's the vine. Don't, don't get it mistaken. But you're producing fruit. It looks like Psalm 1, so to speak. It looks like Galatians, love, joy, peace, kindness, all those things. Don't get it mixed up. It's not fruit for your enjoyment. It's fruit for others. Like, it's an old bumper sticker, but blessed to be a blessing. Like, that's the point of looking for blessing is so that you're a conduit, not a reservoir. Reservoirs are miserable. Conduits are the ones who are alive. But in this arena of marriage, this arena of divorce, I hope you catch the heart of today's um, very easy sermon to give. Um, (laughs) The awesomely powerful priority and importance and sanctity of marriage. I hope that that that's what you, oh man, I see how important, that's what Jesus is focusing on. I also hope that we walk out gracious people, merciful people, sensitive biblically people, loving people. And I just want to share a story that I I just heard yesterday. I was at a conference, uh, had the opportunity to speak with my father at this conference with a couple hundred men from different Calvaries in the Tampa area. And um, when you're in that kind of setting, people will come and just ask a lot of questions after a teaching or They'll open up about what's going on in their life and that kind of a thing. And so just do the very best you can to serve and love and give biblical perspective. And one of the questions was about marriage. And my father shared this thing about this song that was sung at my mother and he's ceremony, obviously, but also at their 25th renewal. Um, He was sharing this context that he always wanted to show to my brother and sister and I well, what I'm talking about, like the importance and priority and sanctity of marriage. He said, we wanted to have a ceremony at year 25 where I walked my mom down the aisle and we were a part of it and we got to see like, wow, marriage is a good thing. It's a solid thing. It's worth investing in. And he shared this story that there was a song that was sung at their ceremony, but then at their 25th, they had the actual musical artist share the song in person, live, that was sung. Um, And the song is called Climb the Hill Together. It's not on my playlist. I don't personally know it, but it's a great song, and um, it's a great song. And, um, but my father shared this. He said, it's, it, the song tells a story of building a life together, that this is what marriage is like, is that you're climbing the hill of life, so to speak, together. And when you start, it's like you're at the bottom of a hill, so to speak. Maybe that's a financial thing. Man, we got barely enough two pennies to rub together, and we're sharing Taco Bell tonight, honey. Like, that's what, that's what we're doing. Like, you, you, you keep climbing. Oh, we got a house, sweetie. We got some kids. And you keep climbing and you, and you look back and you go, man, this, this is our whole life. And he shared this story, and I think it's appropriate that you get to a point and you look back and you go, wow, isn't God good? And I have a partner who's with me in this. And, and, I, and I'm sharing a life with. And he said, if you, if you parachute out of that or, or you helicopter someone into that, Maybe the design of marriage, its potency in the sense of everything that's good, you're missing that design, that benefit of that. And I thought it was helpful because I think you want to know from this text that marriage is a good thing. It's worth fighting for. Is it challenging? No, I've never experienced any challenge. (laughs) Yes. Is getting out of the bed after age 40. Yes. Everything worth having is a fight. Everything is challenging that's good. Everything is. 
is it challenging to maintain the right perspective of who God is? Uh, yeah. Welcome to the 21st century. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, act like men. That's not meant to be just a gender thing. It's meant to also, in the root word, to act maturely. But men should be the example of that, of what it looks like to act maturely. It's a fight, but it's a fight worth fighting. It's good. So let's fight for and celebrate what God wants to do in marriage. And I know I recognize not everyone here is in that capacity. Hopefully this is somewhat instructional for future years. But also I think the theme is simply this. You can trust that God's ways are truly best and good, but also for your good. And, and you can apply that theme into any arena of your life. Are you afflicted? Are you challenged? Are you going through loss? Is there difficulty? Martin would tell you that's the best book in my library of what it looks like to hit the bullseye, what I'm designed for. I'm here to become like Jesus. That's the win. That's the, that's the bullseye. That's ultimately what I desire and design for. And so I pray this morning that as we leave this place with a teaching that is rigid, I understand that. It is revolutionary. Even the words of Jesus now for the context of how, how important marriage is, that we would leave this place as merciful, gracious people that are thankful for the goodness of God in our lives.